my recollection was that the Asian economic crisis, which is called an Asian economic crisis, even though Russia and Brazil were two of the largest economies hammered by it, that at exactly that moment, a lot of the discussion of Marx in those places dried up precisely because they would have to start to deal not just with Marx's analytical diagnosis of capitalism, but his understanding of crises and the inevitability of disequilibrium and crisis. But again, one of the things that I think you can learn from Marx, and I, I emphasize this uh, more when I teach it now, is that he doesn't actually talk about uh, the transition to socialism or communism. He doesn't talk about that very much at all. And in fact, he, he, he doesn't talk about that you know, he was not anti-utopian, so that he didn't want to lay out blueprints. But what you do get in Capital is a theory of how societies change. And a lot of that is located in a footnote in chapter 15, which now I spend a lot of time on. I spent about a whole session on just on that footnote, which I didn't do when I was teaching it back in, in your time. I didn't recognize quite the significance of that. But as a theory of social change, it not only tells you how... Which footnote is... It's the, it's, the, it's the footnote where he talks about his relationship to Darwin and how technology okay. discloses the relations, the social relations and, and relation to nature and all those kinds of things. So I spent a lot of time on this, you see, and I kind of say, well, actually, what, he's, what, what we're seeing there is, is, is an argument about how feudalism transformed into capitalism. If that's how that happened, then what we should do is use the, 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 the ideas in that footnote to think about the transition to socialism, which allows you to have a critique of what went wrong in the Soviet Union, what went wrong in, in actually existing communism, and why they, 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 they didn't yeah. succeed as much as they, they, they could have done if they had had a better, better idea of uh, what communist development should be about. And I can, so I emphasize that that footnote is not only about telling us what has happened, but also we can use it as a way of theorizing about how to change the society we're in. I probably remarked in the first uh, lecture, Marx rarely, if ever, uh, attempts to create a kind of a manual of procedure that he's following. Uh, so if you want to know what his method is, you, you have to either watch him do it, like as you do in Capital, uh, or else you have to resort to con sort of consideration of these occasional, very cryptic, condensed statements uh, about uh, how he is going about uh, understanding the world and what it means to uh, try to apply that method to the understanding of a capitalist mode of production. And in this uh, footnote, he actually lays out many basic ideas. Uh, and the first, of course, deals with his relationship uh, with Darwin. Uh, when he kind of says, uh, a critical history of technology. Again, an interesting phrase because at this point in time nobody had ever thought probably of writing a critical history of technology, so that in itself was an innovative idea at the time. But he said, would show how little of the inventions of the 18th century are the work of a single individual as such, as yet such a book does not exist. Darwin has directed attention to the history of natural technology, i.e. the formation of the organs of plants and animals, which serve as the instruments of production for, su for sustaining their life. And this is an interesting idea that evolution uh, is equipping organisms with instruments of production for sustaining their life. And then Marx goes on to say, does not the history of the productive organs of man in society, of organs that are the material basis of every particular organization of society, deserve equal attention? And would not such a history be easier to compile since, as Vico says, human history differs from natural history in that we have made the former but not the latter? Uh, Vico's argument was that 
as far as natural law was concerned, we would never be in a position to understand it. Uh, that was God's domain, uh, and God works in mysterious ways, so we would never really properly understand it, but that we could understand what we ourselves had done, and that therefore human history was uh, less mysterious, or could be made less mysterious, simply because it was humans who had made it, and Marx is taking up that idea. Now, the point of the history of technology has been uh, actually already advanced and set out a couple of times already in the preceding pages. For instance, if you go back to uh, uh, page uh, 286, uh, there he talks about uh, Franklin and defining man as a tool-making animal and he says that uh, relics of bygone instruments of labor possess the same importance for the investigation of extinct economic formations uh, society, of society as do fossil bones for the determination of extinct species of animals. It is not what is, what is made, but how, and by what instruments of labor that distinguishes different economic epochs. There's a footnote there, where footnote six, where he says the writers of history have so far paid very little attention to the development of material production, which is the basis of all social life, and therefore of all real history. And again, on page 468, he says the Roman Empire handed down the elementary form of all machinery in the shape of the water wheel. The handicraft period bequeathed to us the great inventions of the compass, gunpowder, type printing, and the automatic clock, but on the whole machinery played that subordinate part which Adam Smith assigns to it in comparison with division of labor. So this idea that there has been a human evolutionary process in which we can distinguish something about the differences which have occurred in different societies by the nature of the technologies which we see. This idea is very important in Marx, uh, and very important in Marxian historiography. Uh, but we need to think closely about exactly what that means, and we'll get to that in a minute. Of course, Marx here is also seeing himself as talking about the evolution of human society and seeing that as a continuation of the sorts of arguments that Darwin had laid out about the evolution uh, of the natural order in general. So in a way Marx saw himself as continuing Darwin's work uh, into human history, uh, but with a qualitative shift for the reasons that Vico had, had laid out. But he was greatly admiring of the way in which Darwin had actually been prepared to write about evolution in the particular way uh, that he had, even though elsewhere you find Marx being critical of what it is that Darwin actually sees. In a kind of a commentary he wrote to Engels, I think it was, and I'm quoting from memory here, Marx says something like, you know, it, it's, it's amusing to see how Darwin, when he looks at nature, sees all of those divisions of labor and specializations of functions and all of the competitive world and survival of the fittest and uh, all the rest of it that uh, actually was characteristic of British industrial capitalism at the time. And uh, there's one kind of interesting reason for that, which was that uh, uh, Darwin was married to the daughter of uh, Sir Josiah Wedgwood, who happened to be one of the great potteries industrialists, so that uh, Darwin was very, very familiar with uh, those aspects of British capitalism which were about specialization, division of labor, uh, competition, and uh, all, all the rest of it. Uh, of course, uh, in the history of evolution, the Russian evolutionists couldn't understand Darwin at all, and they emphasized things like uh, uh, cooperation and collaboration, uh, and one of the famous uh, sort of naturalists uh, from that uh, environment was none other than Kropotkin, uh, who uh, sort of provided the antidote to social Darwinism by uh, talking about societies based on mutual aid uh, and understanding. 
But in a way, Darwin's uh, predilection to see uh, British society and the natural world uh, is given away in Darwin's actual introduction. Because Darwin, in his introduction to the Origin of Species, says, well, he was casting around for a way to think of the, the things that he was looking at, and he got very impressed when he read Malthus's Principles of Population. So it actually it was a kind of a social analysis uh, that Malthus produced, which was Darwin's inspiration. And uh, since by and large Marx could not stand Malthus, uh, it would be understandable that uh, Marx would very quickly see in Darwin's Origin of Species by that reference that there was a social underpinning, a set of social metaphors uh, that were going to be drawn into the, the, the actual way in which uh, Darwin depicted the evolutionary process. So the thing we draw from this is that Marx is going to be concerned with an evolutionary process, with a dynamics. Uh, he's never going to talk about society as some static entity. He's always going to talk about it as something in motion, constantly evolving from one form to another. And this, of course, underlies the language which we've drawn attention to several times, which is this language about process. Marx is always talking about the fluidity of process, the fluidity of change how things are changing, how this is evolving out of that. And in this chapter, of course, we're going to see how industrial capitalism emerges out of manufacturing. And how simpler systems of cooperation and divisions of labor are put together in a radically different way to constitute a distinctively capitalist mode of production, which is different from the manufacturing <coughs> mode of production which he has analyzed in the preceding chapter. The second part of this quote is, I think, even more intriguing and more important to grapple with. What he does in the second part is to set up uh, an argument about relations between what I will call moments. He says, technology reveals the active relation of man to nature the direct process of the production of his life, and thereby it also lays bare the process of the production of the social relations of his life and of the mental conceptions that flow from these relations. What this is doing in effect is setting up a set of categories through which we start to look at this evolutionary process. And the categories look like this. We have technology. The technology is expressive of something which is a relation to nature. Then we talk about the actual process of production. And while Marx doesn't break this out for separate consideration, it is the this process of production whereby life is reproduced. So we have, if you like, another category here which we can, in a shadowy way, introduce, which is the reproduction of daily life. Then we have a set of social relations. And then we have a set of mental conceptions of the world. Now the interesting thing here is to immediately sit down and say, how is Marx understanding the relations between these elements. One way in which you could look at this is you could say that Marx is a technological determinist. 
If you have had the misfortune to read Thomas Friedman's Flat Earth Society piece, at some point or other he says, well, people are accusing me of being a technological determinist and that's Marx. And he said, well, if that's the case, I'm a Marxist. And a lot of the reviewers kind of went into this thing about how Marx is a technological determinist and Friedman is following Marx, which is kind of pretty ridiculous when you think of the politics of it, but it's even substantively, I think, incorrect. Because Marx does not say technology determines. He says technology reveals. In the other translation it is technology discloses. The relation to nature. So we're going to look at that relationship then between technology and nature. And we can actually even, if we wish, push this a bit further and to talk about the process of production of nature, how human beings are producing nature through their new technologies, through things like genetic engineering, modification of plants, animals, modification of environments, there is a process of production of nature going on. So when Marx is talking about technology, he's talking about a, a, a relation between the two. And of course there is a relationship between technology and the labour process. The process of production is essentially the labour process. And as we've seen, labour processes occur under given technological conditions, and the technological conditions change, and the labour processes change. But as they change, so, of course, does the whole process of reproduction of daily life. What is daily life about? What kinds of commodities are we getting? How is daily life lived by the labourer in the factory, but also in the reproduction process. And of course technology is caught up, as is our reproduction of daily life, with social relations. In social relations and mental conceptions. Mental conceptions are embodied in technologies. Right? At the same time as technologies profoundly affect our mental conceptions. I mean, we started to understand the world very, very differently when we had things like microscopes and telescopes. We started to understand you know, the technology that allows us to see, which is an extension of our seeing capacity. We can now see into outer space, thanks to you know, Hubble telescopes and things like that. So the technologies are altering our mental conceptions at the same time as our mental conceptions are being embodied in the technologies. So what I think Marx is doing here is setting up these categories in order to draw attention to those moments, if you like, where dynamic change can occur. Now if you reflect on this, you will see a number of different theories of social change. If you say technology is the one, is the prime force, and it causes all the others to change, then you're in a position of being a technological determinist. If you say nature is the prime force, then you're being an environmental determinist. You'd be a Jared Diamond or a Jeffrey Sachs. If you said the process of production, the labour process, is the primary force of change, you'd be siding with a lot of the autonomista, worker Marxists in Italy, who kind of, somebody like John Holloway, who kind of says, in, in changing the world without taking power, the only place where real change occurs is through a transformation of labouring. And it is therefore a very workerist kind of understanding of the dynamics and dialectics of change. That this is the point which gives you change. What about reproduction of daily life? Well, there are many people who start to say, look, you've got to change your lifestyle in order to change the world. 
If you want the world to change, then you know you have to sort of uh, change your consumption habits. The personal is political, uh, and movements around uh, sexuality, movements around uh, uh, the actual reproduction process in the household, all those kinds of things play a very big role in, in, in social change. So you'll find people who are kind of say, well, that's where it's really at. And then, of course, social relations. I mean, you could say Marx was not a technological determinist, but he was a class struggle determinist. You know, class struggle is the moving force of history. And he says that in various places. It is a mo moving force of historical change. What about mental conceptions of the world? Well, if you're a Hegelian idealist, you say it's all, you know, that's what really is critical. And you don't have to be a Hegelian idealist to say, actually, it's ideas that change the world. And you'll find people write things and say, well, it was a change of ideas that changed everything. In her most recent book, for example, Naomi Klein in Disaster Capitalism comes close to attributing it all to the ideas of Milton Friedman. I mean, you know, she does. And, and, and uh, I mean, there's some very interesting, very good stuff in there, but at a certain point, it seems like the forcing thing was Milton Friedman sitting down there and rewriting a bunch of ideas, and then everybody suddenly got them locked in their head and started behaving like mini Friedmanites. So, this is, it, it is interesting when you kind of look at this to say, well, how many historical things have you read which puts one or other of these in the forefront of the thing? Now, is Marx doing that? Is Marx actually doing that here? And I don't think the answer is, from what you've read of Capital so far, you'd have to say, no. He doesn't use causal language. He doesn't say, a change in this causes all of these things to change. It's not even a kind of interactive, dynamic model in which that affects that, and then this affects something else, and it comes back and affects the type technology. I don't think it's even that. More problematically, the question is, is this a classic Hegelian idea of the totality? Because Hegel's idea of a totality, of a totality was elements which are locked together as internal relations each of each other. And it's a kind of organic view of the totality. And again, I don't think Marx is being Hegelian. He probably sets it up, coming out of the Hegelian view, that you need to specify the distinctive moments which are at work, transforming the world. But in a Hegelian view, this organic system, if you like, would have an immanence. It would be evolving in some kind of way according to a very tightly specified dynamic of possibilities. Marx, it seems to me, is leaving this much more open. It's a much more ecological kind of system. These are in relation to each other, yes, and they're constantly interactive with each other, but you cannot actually determine the interaction within the world of nature, for example, simply by looking at what's happening everywhere else. There is something autonomous about every one of these moments, so that there is the possibility of all kinds of radical transformations occurring. And if you look, and this is something we need to look at in this chapter on machinery, if you look at how he sets up the argument about machinery, you will see that he invokes many of these elements throughout. He will be talking about mental conceptions, he will be talking about science and technology, the way in which mental conceptions get incorporated in the machine, the way in which mental conceptions are set up in the design of the machine. So, but he doesn't say, therefore, it, it's the inventors who've changed the world. Again, for some of the reasons I've suggested, that is, the technology has as much to do with the mental conceptions as the mental conceptions with the technology. There's a, there's a, there's a powerful connectivity there. 
Again, these technologies are not absent a connectivity to social relations. And again, you'll see in this chapter, when he's talking about technologies, he's kind of saying, the defining thing about a technology is often the positionality of the worker in the labor process and the social relation which comes out of it in relationship to capital. And when he gets to things like, you know, what's going on on the land, and what happened when James Watt came up with the steam engine, we see the relation to nature suddenly getting radically transformed. So we have all of these elements which are playing together. And this, I think, plays a very important, in terms, a important role in asking questions about how we understand what is going on in the world. And I remember once I had a... I was invited to South Korea, what, two years ago now, uh, to chair a jury about the design of a new town, a complete new city they were going to build in, in Central Korea. And uh, we had all these designs to look at, and I was there with architects, and I was there with the urban designers, all this kind of thing. And they were absolutely enamored of the strength of, you know, circle shapes and square shapes and all these kinds of things. And they were, they were actually discussing designs in those terms. And I said, well, look, I think we're talking about this new city. There are a number of questions we need to ask. And the questions are, what kind of relation to nature is going to be constructed in this new city? How is it going to be articulated? What kind of daily life is going to be lived in this city? And would you as architects or designers or engineers want to live in it? What kind of social relations are there going to be? Because the city was essentially going to be an administrative center. They were going to decant all of the office spaces of all the government uh, uh, ministries to this space. And I just said, that's a recipe for total boring disaster, if you think of it. It'll be a kind of socio-technocratic misery, you know? So, are those the kinds of social relations you want to live with? And what kind of symbolism are we constructing here? Is this going to be a symbol of national identity? Is it going to be a cosmopolitan kind of idea? What, what kind of mental conception are you going to try and project into the world with this? So, we were, I went around sort of laying out these, these categorizations. They never thought of this, see? But they, they thought about it, and they thought it was great for about ten minutes, and then they went back to circles and <laughs> squares and, and made their decision. But afterwards, a couple of them came out to me and said, you know, that's such a great way of thinking about it. I'd never thought of that about that before. Where did you get that from? I said, well, it's in footnote four <laughs> of, of Capital, Chapter on Machinery and, and Industry. And of course, you know, they all can say, oh, God, there you go again. We always knew you were kind of just like that, you know. So. But actually, if you, were do, if, if you were doing an anthropological inquiry into something, wouldn't this be a sensible set of issues to sort of just set up at the outset? Let's think about all these things. Let's think how they are interactive together. Let's think about the dynamism that is working them through. But this also plays, I think, a critical role in thinking about any kind of revolutionary process. That is, what would the transition to socialism out of capitalism look like? What would it have to engage with? And my argument would be it would have to engage with all of these elements. One of the big problems, it seems to me, of lately lamented, actually existing communism was that it didn't do that. It didn't ask these questions about daily life. It didn't ask these questions about the relation to nature. It didn't imagine a world of dynamic interactions and dynamic transformations. And this would then lay back a, bit, a little bit and explain why, although Marx says that class struggle is the motor of history, he also says ideas are a material force in history. Because you can have all kinds of wishes about transforming your social relations, but unless you can change ideas, 
the hegemony of ideas and all the rest of it, unless you can change that, nothing's going to happen on the social relations front. And we ha therefore have to think of this as a dynamic interaction. Now, there are some theorists who, it seems to me, have taken up this sort of mode of thinking in recent times. In the Marxist tradition, you have, for example, Lefebvre. Now, Lefebvre likes to talk, talk about ensembles of relations. And this is, this is not an organic system in the sense of a, just an organism. It's organic in the sense of an ecology of an ensemble of relations which we're looking at. And so Lefebvre, in a sense, is highlighting this idea that the ensemble of relations is, is crucial to look at. Another person who comes out of the Marxist tradition, although most Americans don't do it, this, you know, it's like they always think Foucault is outside of it, they also think Deleuze is outside of it. Deleuze is very much in it. And Deleuze talks about an assemblage. And his idea of an assemblage is very much like this. So you do have ways of thinking in Marx which when you think of them dialectically, but this is again the point, if you read this, if you read this passage in abstraction, then you're going to get one way of interpreting it. My interpretation of it comes out very much from seeing how Marx works in Capital and then asking questions like, all right, how is he talking about the labour process? How is he talking about technology? How is he talking about the relation to nature? Are they all implicated at various points in the argument? And I think, as we've seen, yes, they're always being implicated, sometimes very softly so, just an occasional kind of, well, there's something about the relation to nature here which is important, or yeah, there's something about social relations here, or yeah, there's something about daily life, but we'll see all of these elements cropping up in this particular chapter. The other thing this does, by thinking this through theoretically in this kind of way, is to give you a way of critiquing. I mean, the way that, for instance, I tried to critique what was being set up around this new town, it gives you a mode of critique. And it also gives you a mode of critique of Marx himself. To what degree is he making suppositions about, for example, the way in which mental conceptions get internalized in technologies and he omits, as it were, certain other aspects of the problem. In my view, for example, in this chapter, he pays very little attention to the reproduction of daily life except in a few specific places. And you could genuinely critique him for that. And as I think we will see as we go through, I think there are some very interesting residual problems which he leaves in his account of machinery and modern industry, which we'll get to in due course. So it's a way of saying, well, okay, Carlos, you've set this up in this particular way. How well are you really keeping to it? And the answer is pretty damn well, but there are many elements where you could kind of say there's real room for significant transformation or improvement of what he's had to say. So that you're not locked in, as it were, to, oh well, he has said everything that has to be said about the universe. But I find this way of thinking about it very compelling, provided you don't treat it as a causal structure, you don't treat it as a deterministic structure, you don't treat it as a sort of a Hegelian totality structure, but you treat it as a kind of open ensemble or an open uh, assemblage uh, of moments in a process, because he's interested in the evolution of society. That's the first part of this quote. I'm interested in how society evolves. Second part of the quote is, it's going to evolve by all of these being evolved in a co-evolution process of some kind. So he's setting up a co-evolutionary model of how to understand the dynamics of capitalism and how to understand the transition from feudalism to capitalism. 
and I think that the implication is therefore that we should be thinking about this kind of thing in thinking about the transition from capitalism to socialism or anarchism or whatever ism you particularly uh, have in mind. Now the last part of the quote takes us onto even more complicated terrain, particularly when put in relationship to this part of the quote. Here he says this, Even the history of religion that is written in abstraction from this material basis is uncritical. So this, by the way, is the material basis, this whole set of relations. It is in reality much easier to discover by analysis the earthly kernel of the mystic creations of religion than to do the opposite, i.e. to develop from the actual given relations of life the forms in which these have to be apotheosized. The latter method is the only material, materialist and therefore the only scientific one. The weaknesses of the abstract materialism of natural science, a materialism which excludes the historical process, are immediately ev evident from the abstract and ideological conceptions expressed by its spokesmen whenever they venture beyond the bounds of their own speciality. You can have a great time going off and collecting evidence of that sort of thing in contemporary society as scientists get in and start telling you how the social world should be organized without even understanding that they drew metaphors from the social world in order to construct the social world. I mean, this is great. But even more important here is this thing about this is the only truly scientific method. And it brings us back to something he wrote well before in there is some argument as to whether he's still holding to that when he's writing Capital, but if you want any evidence on it, you go back to page 175, right at the beginning of the text. And you go back to footnote 35, the bottom, and you go to the bottom of that footnote, where he quotes from his 1859 Critique of Political Economy, the preface, which is a very famous passage which is always being quoted, and he quotes it here. He says, My view is that each particular mode of production, and the relations of production corresponding to it at each given moment, in short, the economic structure of society, is the real foundation on which there arises a legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. And that the mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political and intellectual life. What he leaves out here, however, is the following couple of sentences, in which he says, it is in the superstructure where we become conscious of questions and where we fight out political struggles. Now what he's laying out here is what is generally known as the base superstructure argument. There is supposedly an economic base upon which there arises a superstructure of thought, of politics, of law, and the like. Now again, you have to ask yourself the question, is Marx talking in a deterministic mode here? That is, is he saying the economic basis, which is technology, process of production, social relations and all the rest of it, is he saying the economic basis determines the superstructure. And the answer, I think, is no, he's not saying determines at all, he very rarely uses phrases like determines. I mean, he'll use it in a logical sense, but he won't use it about a social process. 
So think back how this actually worked in the chapter on the working day. How did it work? The basis of the whole argument about the working day is this. That value is socially necessary labour time. Time is therefore central. Moments are the elements of profit. Capitalists are interested in time, they're interested in workers' time. They steal the seconds, they steal the minutes. They want to lengthen the working day, they're into that. Why? Because socially necessary labour time is the measure of value. So that, if you, you like, is the economic base. And that explains, when you're looking at the chapter on the working day, why in the history of capitalism the struggle over the working day and over temporality has been so central. Now if you don't make that connection you're going to have a hell of a time explaining why it is that capitalists do all the things they do around temporality, why they fight over minutes and seconds, tea breaks and all that kind of stuff. It's very hard to explain it unless you've got some kind of real force which is explaining it, and Marx gives you a very simple way of understanding that. But then when you look at how the, how the argument over the length of the working day evolved, remember the dialogue between the capitalist and the labourer at the beginning? The capitalist says, I have my rights when I take as much as I can of your labour time. And the worker says, but excuse me, you're also taking a chunk of my life, you can't do that. Both, remember, working through the law of exchanges. And under those conditions, what happens? Between equal rights, force decides. Well, how did the equality of rights arise? How is it, therefore, that force decides? Now, would you say, from reading that chapter, that somehow or other it was all mechanically determined? You wouldn't say that at all. You would say, well, there were shifting class alliances. There was a dynamic in England at the time around this, and the dynamic was connected to dynamics which were going on in France, and also what was going on in North America and so on, but it's a very fluid kind of political process. And Marx is not saying that that process, the outcome of that process is determined in advance. As he says at the end of that chapter, it depends on workers putting their heads together and deciding they're going to have a, a tremendous kind of solidarious campaign to make absolutely sure that they have a reasonable length of working day. But, notice, that does not abolish the problem which is there, which is that capitalists need socially necessary labour time in order to perpetuate themselves. Which explains why the struggles over the working day and over working time and all that kind of thing are never ultimately resolved under capitalism. They are perpetual. They are as significant now as they were in Marx's time. They are registered differently, there's a different legal superstructure, there's different politics around it and all the rest of it, but it's the same damn problem. And what Marx is saying is that problem is something which exists in the very foundation of what a capitalist mode of production is necessarily about. And you're not going to get rid of it until you get rid of capitalism. End of story. Yeah, you can nuance it, you know, you can have a 35-day week, and yeah, you can go to a 35-hour week, you can have, a, uh, you know, all kinds of adjustments of that kind, but you can't get rid of the problem, and the debate will not go away. The capitalist class will, at various points, come back as it has come back and said, we want more hours, we want more time. There's a big protest about the CUNY contract tomorrow, right? And the last CUNY contract extended the working year of CUNY employees by about four or five days. That's what they wanted. They wanted the extra time. So it never goes away. It's always there. It's always there. Everybody's always facing it. So what Marx is saying here is that the only scientific method is you need a concept, and this is where the value theory concept starts to really kick in, you need a concept which helps you explain why that phenomenon is always with us and won't go away. 
And that phenomena is, as he would say, in the economic base. And that's what the economic base is about. So I think what you have to do here is to say again, this is not a deterministic relationship, it's more a dialectical in relation. A dialectical relation between the constant search for socially necessary labour time on the part of the capitalists, and the constant forms of resistance from those people from whom the surplus labour time is constantly being taken away. And that's the working class. Which then does indeed put you into the dynamics of class struggle. So here he is not, I think, getting into again a causal, simple kind of mechanical sort of model. And one of the biggest difficulties, it seems to me, are the positivist readings of Marx, the mechanistic readings of Marx. I mean, somebody who comes in who says the only model of science which is valid is causality, mechanistic understanding, would read this and turn this into a mechanistic model. Then they would test it and find it's all wrong, and say, well, so Marx is stupid. I mean, that's what a lot of them do. And there are a lot of people within Marxism who do that. For example, the idea that productive forces are the motor of history is a very long-standing one within many communist theorists, and even outside of communist theories. If you want to get one of the best examples of a very intellectual defence of the idea, you'll read G. A. Cohen's Karl Marx's Theory of History of Defence, which argues that Marx is attributing to the productive forces, i.e. technologies, a primacy in the transformation, in historical transformation. So there has been a battle within Marxism over this question. The big battle is between they who, those who say it's class struggle and those who say it's technology. Now we have the autonomistas saying it's the labour process. So even within Marxism you will find very significant battles, including also over the base and superstructure imagery. But this is one of the places where you can start to sort that out. But again, you don't sort it out theoretically in the sense of kind of, I don't know, finding odd quotes from Marx that support the class struggle view or some other view. You sort it out, it seems to me, by actually looking carefully at how he situates all of these elements together in the account that he's giving in Capital. So that is why this cryptic theoretical statement at the beginning of machinery and large-scale industry is so important. Because it says something about that, but it also draws your attention to the fact that he has this in mind in writing this chapter. So one of the things you have to do is to read this chapter with this in mind. Don't treat it as some sort of aside. No, you've got to read the chapter as an example of how this sort of thing works. And if you do it that way, I think you'll get a very good idea of exactly how Marx actually proceeds, as opposed to the myriad accounts you'll have of how Marx was supposed to have proceeded, many of which are guided by, as I've said, positivist, causal, logics and so on, which Marx just doesn't utilise in, in, in capital, he can't find it. OK, I'm going to stop here and get some discussion from you on this. I mean, are there some things here that you're kind of finding problematic and want elucidated? Yeah. Uh, it seems like M Marx lays out these elements pretty clearly, and I'm wondering why he left out some of, some of these elements that he pretty elusively sees and separates in his own account. And then the second part of my question... In his own account of what? Of, of, capi of machinery? Of capital and machinery. I mean, throughout, throughout the book, I okay. think, there, he references some of these things, but there's clearly a lot more tension. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Um, and my sec my sec the second part of the question is, um, if Lefebvre is then foregrounding sort of these issues of the reproduction of, of 
daily life, or if he's actually, if it's more that he's simply filling in what he saw as something that was underanalyzed by Mark. Yeah, I think no question Lefebvre in uh, the critique of everyday life is trying to correct what he saw as a lack of attention to this reproduction of daily life, everyday life kind of issues. And, and so there's no question that Lefebvre thought this was a, a gap. And it was through that that he started to mount a critique of Stalinism within the Communist Party. You know, it was through that sort of strategy that he uh, that, that he, he pursued that, that path and began to develop a certain critique of Soviet, uh, Soviet practices, which led him eventually to be thrown out of the, uh, thrown out of the Communist Party. But um, yeah, there's no question that, that, that Lefebvre saw some of these elements under-theorized. And that, but here's an interesting question. Are they really so under-theorized or un, uh, are they not paid enough attention to in Marx, or is it the Marxists? that didn't pay attention to them. My argument would be, many of them, as you correctly said, are underplayed in capital, but there are always elements of them there. Whereas I think the, the big problem was when the Marxists came along and kind of said, the productive forces are the ones that matter, change the productive forces, everything changes with it. Didn't happen. Soviet Union got into a big mess. Uh, the relation to nature doesn't matter, you know, got into a big environmental mess. So I think that, 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 that you know, the problem of what the Marxists did, and, and like I said, you know, G.A. Cohen, extremely talented analytical philosopher, and it's the analytical is the problem, he hates dialectics. Uh, and basically he calls dialectics bullshit Marxism. So, so and, and they, they had a logo which, where they, the analytical people called, the analytical Marxists called themselves the non-bullshit Marxists. So, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of problems within the Marxist tradition as how this is how this is set up, um, but we we will look, I think, in this chapter a little bit about how these elements are integ are integrated. Again, sometimes it is in a quiet voice, you know. Okay, there's something going on here which you should pay attention to. I'm not going to pay big attention to it because, you know, I I want to get to the, I want to get to the end of this this book, you know, and uh, sort of thing. So it's a bit that, but you will see elements of it. Uh, yeah, John Stuart Mill. Uh, kind of naively wondered when he kind of says, it's questionable if all the mechanical inventions yet made have lightened the day's toil of any human being. And Marx, of course, answers, well, of course not, because machines were not invented to do that. They were invented uh, to produce surplus value. Now, it, interestingly, immediately, you're going to find uh, a tension, which Marx is very well aware of, between the idea that machines produce surplus value when we know that machines are past dead labor and they cannot produce value. So you're going to have a situation where Marx is going to be talking about machines as a source of surplus value, as a source of relative surplus value, when we know that machines are not a source of value. And from this, by the way, will then follow the idea that capitalists get that machines are a source of value. I mean, if they're a source of surplus value and relative surplus value, they must be a source of value. So therefore, capitalists start to fetishize the machine and believe that the machine is the answer to all things, and we'll see some cases where that comes about. Now, and the very first gesture, however, is to set up a distinction between tools and machines. And the immediately what you find is that Marx here is talking about not so much the physical notion of the tool and the machine, but its social positioning in relationship to the labor process. So immediately you've got into the idea that the technology and the social positioning and the labor process are three elements in this discussion. And we start to see how those three elements produce something which he calls on 493 the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century. Again, Marx pioneered pretty much in talking about the notion of an industrial revolution. And he's very interested in talking about exactly what the nature of that in, in revolution is, and this first section is about the dynamics of that process.
Now, clearly, the machine begins with the tool. But what happens, as he says on 495, is there is a moment, it's right in the center, that the tool proper is taken from man and fitted into a mechanism. A machine takes the place of a mere implement. In 497, he comes to the conclusion the machine, middle of the page 497, the machine, which is the starting point of the Industrial Revolution, replaces the worker, who handles a single tool by a mechanism operating with a number of similar tools and set in motion by a single motive power, whatever the form of that power. And he then talks bottom of the page about horsepower, <coughs> then he talks about water power, and then on top of 499 he introduces a radical shift in the motive power, when he says, not till the invention of Watt's second and so-called double-acting steam engine was a prime mover found which drew its own motive power from the consumption of coal and water, was entirely under man's control, was mobile and a means of lo locomotion, was urban and not like the water wheel rural, permitted production to be concentrated in towns of, like the water wheels, being scattered over the countryside, and finally was of universal technical application and little affected in its choice of residence by local circumstances. This means that industrial output is liberated from a certain set of constraints which are given by the natural circumstances. Where are the water wheels? Where's the water power? With coal you can cart it around, you can concentrate it, bring it into the cities. It's a radically different process. And this process, by the way, uh, was critical for the Industrial Revolution in Britain, for the following reason. That industrial development in Britain in the 18th century was booming along, but was running into a very, very serious resource constraint. The problem was that your fuel reserves, your fuel resources, were coming off the land. It was biomass, it was charcoal, it was wood, and you're cutting down the forests like crazy. And at the same time you need land for food production. What happens when there's a competition between energy supplies and food production that were running head to head in Britain to a point where probably the relation to nature would have stopped any further industrial development. British industry was in crisis in the middle of the 18th century for that very reason. The answer was, go underground. Get the coal from underground. There is no competition between land being used for fuel supplies and land being used for food production. Now there's a connection in all of this because the price of my bagel went up last week from 80 cents to 95 cents. There's an incredible shortage of wheat in the world. Agricultural prices are going through the roof. Why? Ethanol production. We're heading right back into a situation where the land is going to be competed for between energy resources and food resources and food prices are already shooting up, very fast, because the converse, rate of conversion to ethanol you know, throughout Latin America as well as uh, now in the United States is very, very significant. And if you take all that land away from food production, what happens? You get, well, my bagel goes up by 15 cents. Not only that, but actually bread prices around the world are skyrocketing for all these kinds of reasons. So, this move, which can sometimes somehow be seen as a social necessity, a political economic necessity, given the tensions which existed in British industrialism and food supplies at that time, this move radically trans was a technological move that radically transformed the relation to nature, and of course, it allowed 
to be set in train, that whole kind of process which allowed the 19th century essentially to mine out all the stored fuel reserves of the Carboniferous period and the last century to mine out all the stored fuel reserves of the Cretaceous period, and leaving us with the question of what's the next reserve of energy, but now we're seeing as that goes back onto the land what kinds of problems we may f immediately face. But what Marx is doing here then is then saying that we start to reorganize the division of labor, which is considered in the previous chapter, and reorganize cooperation. So f on 501, he starts to talk about ten lines down. Here we have again the cooperation by division of labor, which is peculiar to manufacture, but now it appears as a combination of machines with specific functions. And he talks about the similarities, but then he says, an essential difference at once appears. In manufacture, it is the workers who either singly or in groups must carry on each particular process with their manual implements. The worker has been appropriated by the process, but the process had previously to, to be adapted to the worker. This subjective principle of the division of labor no longer exists in production by machinery. Here the total process is examined objectively, viewed in and for itself, and analyzed into its constitutive phases. The problem of how to execute each particular process, and to bind the differential partial processes in, together in a whole, is solved by the age of machines, chemistry, etc. Chemistry, science and technology, mental conceptions, start to become significant. Bottom of the middle of 502, the collective working machine, which is now an articulated system composed of various kinds of single machine and of groups of single machines, becomes all the more perfect the more the process as a whole becomes a continuous one. Now again, this is the idea of the continuity of the production process. The smooth, continuous flow is absolutely vital again to the whole kind of idea of the circulation of capital. And so the idea of the circulation of capital is being represented here by this reorganization of the process of production with the machine technology. And the, the outcome of this, he says on 503, is an organized system of machines, this is 503 towards the bottom, an organized system of machines to which motion is communicated by the transmitting mechanism from an automatic center is the most developed form of production by machinery. Here we have, in place of the isolated machine, a mechanical monster, Marx loves monsters, whose body fills whole factories and whose demonic power, at first hidden by the slow and measured motions of its gigantic members, finally bursts forth in the fast and feverish whirl of its countless working organs. But he then poses a very particular problem. Who is it who's making the machines? Well, it turns out it's the artisans of the manufacturing period who, through artisan labor, are making the machines. And this poses a limitation. So he says on 504, well, this limitation of skilled labor in making machines was inhibiting the development of the process. And what was required here was a total revolution in machine technologies. And he talks about this on 504. At the top, demand for the newly discovered machines grew larger. The machine making industry increasingly split up into numerous independent branches, and the division of labor within these manufacturers developed accordingly. So, manufacture produced the machinery. But a bit further down, when the system had attained a certain degree of development, it had to overthrow this ready-made foundation which had meanwhile undergone further development in its old form and create for itself a new basis appropriate to its own mode of production. This new basis involves a transformation of social relations. You have to transcend the limits of artisanal labor, 
He talks about that bottom of 504. The, may, you know, the growth of machine, the production of machinery, he says, was dependent on the growth of a class of workers who, owing to the semi-artistic nature of their employment, could increase their numbers only gradually and not by leaps and bounds. The technical basis for handicrafts and manufacture was inadequate. What we see on 505 is the idea that the transformation of the mode of production in one sphere of industry necessitates a similar transformation in other spheres, that is, you get these spillover effects from one sphere to another. Machine spinning made machine weaving necessary, and both together made a mechanical and chemical revolution compulsory in bleaching, printing, and dyeing. And then he goes on to talk about the revolution and the modes of production of industry and agriculture made necessary a revolution in the general conditions of the social process of production, i.e. means of communication and transport. Bottom of that paragraph, hence quite apart from the immense transformation which took place in shipbuilding, the means of communication and transport gradually adapted themselves to the mode of production of large-scale industry by means of a system of river steamers, railways, ocean steamers, and telegraphs. But the huge masses of iron that had now to be forged, welded, cut, bored, and shaped required for their part machines of cyclopean dimensions which the machine-building trades of the period of manufacture were incapable of construction, constructing. Here comes the crucial paragraph. Large-scale industry, therefore, had to take over the machine itself, its own characteristic instrument of production, and to produce machines by means of machines. It was not till it did this that it could create for itself an adequate technical foundation and stand on its own feet. In other words, it was the, the rise of the machine tool industry and the production of machines by machines, which became, as it were, the center of the technology of a capitalist mode of production which was adequate to the requirements of a capitalist mode of production. So this is the revolutionary movement, a movement from tools, to machines, which are produced by artisanal labor and they're sporadic and around the place. These machines are collected together and become a system of interconnected machines. But then you, as you try to extend that system, so you get a, an expansion of demand for more and more machines, which can only may be met by setting up an industry which produces machines by machines. And it is that dynamic which in Marx's view, characterizes what the Industrial Revolution was centrally about. But this had all kinds of implications. And he mentions some of them at the end of this section on 508. There is a replacement, he says, of human force by natural forces and a replacement of the rule of thumb by the conscious application of natural science. In manufacture, the organization of the social labor process is purely subjective. It is a combination of specialized workers. Large-scale industry, on the other hand, possesses in the machine system an entirely objective organization of production, which confronts the worker as a pre-existing material condition of production. Look what this is, is talking about here. Look how he's going around these elements. Natural science, technology is being deployed, technologies are being transformed, social relations are being changed, the process of production is being changed, and so is the relation to nature. All of these elements are actually at work in this section. Nothing about everyday life, but all these other elements are in there. And it was a co-evolution of all of these elements that produced the Industrial Revolution. You couldn't have had the Industrial Revolution, put it this way, without there being a radical transformation of social relations, i.e. the workers move from being su an active subject to being objectively embodied in a radically redesigned labor process, 
which is using the new technologies and mental conceptions, and of course engaging in a completely different relation to nature, through the move to a motive source of power which is, which is underground. In the next section he raises the question of the value transformation transferred by the machinery to the product. We've come across this a bit before. We know that the machine is not a source of value. But we also know that the value embodied in the machine has to be transferred to the product. How is it transferred to the product? Well, it's a fictional process, obviously. So Marx, in effect, sets up a simple straight-line depreciation model, which is if the, if the machine lasts ten years, then one-tenth of the machine disappears into the product every year. So at the end of ten years you've got back the value of your machine, because it's all come out in the product. So this straight-line thing is actually fairly simply set up. But this then actually sets up a very important idea at the end of this section, which is this. At what point do capitalists stop using machines? We can already get a bit of a sense that capitalists are likely to be fetishistically attached to machines because they can produce surplus value. At what point do they stop producing machines? And Marx lays this out on 513, at the top, when he says, It is evident that whenever it costs as much labour to produce a machine as is saved by the employment of that machine, all that has taken place is a displacement of labour. And then he talks about the difference between the labour a machine costs and the labour it saves. And the idea that the productivity of the machine is therefore measured by the human labour power it replaces. And then he talks about this, and on 515 this leads him to specify a limit. 515 in the middle he says, The use of machinery for the exclusive purpose of cheapening the product is limited by the requirement that less labour must be expended in producing the machinery than is displaced by the employment of that machinery. For the capitalist, however, there is a further limit on its use. Instead of paying for the labour, he pays only the value of the labour power employed. The limit to his using a machine is therefore fixed by the difference between the value of the machine and the value of the labour power replaced by it. And then he goes on to talk about, well, if labour has a different value in the United States to what it has in Britain, if the value of labour is much higher in Britain, then obviously employing a machine is going to save you more value in the United States than in Britain. And if labour is dirt cheap in Britain, you won't, you won't employ the machine. So he puts an argument in that actually there's a differential between Britain and the United States in the employment of machinery, simply because the value of labour power is radically different in the United States than it is in Britain. Now, this limitation is a very important part of his argument. It's going to come up again two or three times later, so it's a critical point in the argument. It defines, as it were, a rational kind of point in which a rational capitalist, armed with the right kind of information, would decide, I am not going to go for a new machine because it will replace so many workers uh, that that will not compensate me for the amount I'm going to have to lay out on the machine. Now this immediately, of course, reminds us of something important about machinery. The two forms of relative surplus value he's looked at so far, cooperation and division of labour, were essentially free goods to the capitalist. The capitalists didn't go out into the market and buy them as commodities. They were available to the capitalists and through a reorganisation 
yeah, may involve some capital investment, like building a factory or something, but, but through reorganization, capitalists could benefit from cooperation and division of labor. But the machine is a commodity that you buy in the market. It has a value. You not only have to pay attention to how that value gets transferred into the product, but you also have to cons configure how much of that value which is embodied in the machine is going to be compensated by the labor saving that comes from the employment of the machine. And this is, as he says, a key limitation. And it's going to play a very important role in, the, in understanding the dynamics of accumulation. It poses the question, at what point do capitalists stop playing this game of perpetual technological innovation? And of course capitalists are not always rational, they're also fetishists, so we see many examples in our own society where capitalists go well beyond the point where a rational capitalist would stop employing machines. We'll come to some of that later. Third section. And here I would also want to suggest something about this very long chapter. Pay careful attention to the chapter headings. They really lead you through the chapter, sort of step by step. He's talked about the Industrial Revolution, how it came about, what the dynamic was. He's talked about the transfer of value. Now he wants to talk about the implications for the worker, i.e., the social relations side of, side of things. And the first thing you see is that machines, by the very form in which they're constructed, which are easily utilizable by anybody, permit the employment of women and children in ways that may not have been so easy before. And what this does is to allow the capitalists to start to think that I no longer have to think, when I'm employing people, about the individual wage. All I have to think about is the family wage. So I can employ the whole family. And this immediately leads into those systems, a gang system, where one person would mobilize family, not only their own kids but nephews and that kind of thing, into a gang and become actually an organizer of labor, so it was a kind of almost collective organization of labor, a gang system. But also, what this means is that the capitalists can start to substitute the idea of, all I've got to do is pay a family wage, I can reduce the individual wage. Now there's some actually fascinating historical examples where exactly that has happened. There was an economic miracle in Brazil in the 1960s, under a military dictatorship. And the economic miracle in Brazil mainly consisted in a radical reduction of wages. But it turned out that family wages actually remained stable, because all the women and kids went into the labor force. And actually, if you look at the data in this country, since the 1970s, individual wage has tended to stagnate or go down, in real terms. The family wage, however, has gone up a little bit and then down a little bit. Family wage is a very different entity. And the two graphs of individual wages since the 1970s and family wages, again, in this country what we've seen is a substitution, as it were, of the family wage against the idea of an individual wage. Which, of course, transforms social relations in radical ways. And it also starts to transform what happens in the domestic sphere. Now this is not something that Marx pays that much attention to, but as you'll see in the footnote at the bottom of 518, He says, since certain family functions, such as nurse, nursing and suckling children, 
cannot be entirely suppressed, the mothers who have been confiscated by capital must try substitutes of some sort. Domestic work, such as sewing and mending, must be replaced by the purchase of ready-made articles. Hence the diminished expenditure of labour in the house is accompanied by an increased expenditure of money outside. The cost of production of the working class family therefore increases and balances its greater income. In addition to this, economy and judgment in the consumption and preparation of the means of subsistence become impossible. And then he refers to the ways in which these materials can be studied in the reports of the inspectors of factories. So there's a transformation in gender relations which is involved here, and also generational relations between parents and children because of this gang system. There's also transformations occurring in the domestic sphere. So this is one of those moments where he does indeed mention the reproduction of daily life, but it's just a casual mention, a little bit to one side. But it sort of suggests, well, he's aware of the issue. But again, he's not going to make it central to his argument. Uh, he probably should have made it more central than he did, but uh, at least he's aware that this is, this is an issue. So this then immediately brings him, of course, to say, well, what are the implications of the importation of children into the process of production? Different kind of… Into, 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 and then we get into, again, the factory acts, uh, the factory inspectors and the kinds of things they're reporting about what on earth is happening to kids uh, in, in, in the production process, and so there's a, a little bit of time on that, and then he kind of says, and of course, one of the things they then get into is they want to have schools and things like that, so he kind of uh, debunks this idea that this is anything like a real education. So the main point here is that machinery, when it comes in, allows a different deployment of family labour. Now there are moments in here when, of course, he starts to sound like, well, okay, women can, can't do the heavy lifting, the fact that you've got machines allows them to machine minders and all that kind of thing, they're easier to use, issues of that kind in, in this section, but the general point he's making I think is, is significant, which is that when you get these radical transformations in, in technology and, 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 and in machinery in particular, you cannot imagine that occurring without a radical transformation of social relations of some kind, and the two are implicated in each other. The second is the prolongation of the working day. It starts on 526. And he talks about the way in which the conditions of labour lead to a lot of incentives to increase the length of the working day. They give you the, the power to do it and the incentives to do it. And these conditions are partly this, that the machine, through its objective qualities of the continuity of the production process, which it allows, Makes tremendous, puts tremendous emphasis on the continuity of the presence of the labourer. The labourer has to be there to service the machine all of the time. The labourer is not in control of the machine, the machine is more in control of the labourer. And as he says on the bottom of 526, because it is capital, the automatic mechanism is endowed in the person of the capitalist with consciousness and a will. Interesting kind of argument here, he's kind of saying the mental conceptions actually shift. As capital, therefore, it is animated by the drive to reduce to a minimum the resistance offered by man, that obstinate yet elastic natural barrier. This resistance is moreover lessened by the apparently undemanding nature of work at a machine and the more pliant and docile character of the women and children employed by preference. The historical record shows that women were by nowhere near as docile as Marx is imagining. But then he goes on to talk about the active lifetime of a machine, however, is clearly dependent on the length of the working day, which then leads him 
on 528 to talk about the case of moral depreciation, which we've already briefly mentioned. I want to get my money back out of my machine. It's going to last ten years physically. But if the competition comes in and replaces it with a far superior machine, I have to get rid of it in three years and get a new machine. And so there's every incentive for me to try to get my money back out of that machine as fast as I can. Which means that I want to employ it twenty-four hours a day. So there's a great incentive out of moral depreciation to keep the machinery working twenty-four hours a day, which means, of course, you've got to have labourers there twenty-four hours a day. Because he here introduces a very important concept, which is the idea of devaluation. As he says on 528, the young and full of life, however young and full of life the machine may be, its value is no longer determined by the necessary labour time actually objectified in it, but by the labour time necessary to reproduce either it or the better machine. It has therefore been devalued. And capitalists don't like to have their machinery devalued. But, of course, capitalists can't do without machinery, and as he says on 5.30, again at the top, machinery produces relative surplus value. And he then talks about a certain contradiction, because by removing labour from the labour process, you're taking away one of the, well, taking away the source of value production. So why would you use a machine which costs you something in value in order to remove a chunk of the labour force from production? when it's the labour force that's producing your surplus value. Conundrum. And actually it's very, going to be very important for the analysis in capital, because it's a contradiction. And he says on the middle of 531, Hence, he says, there is an imminent contradiction in the application of machinery to the production of surplus value. Since. Of the two factors of the surplus value created by a given amount of capital, one, the rate of surplus value, cannot be increased except by diminishing the other, the number of workers. This contradiction comes to light as soon as machinery has come into general use in a given industry. For, for then, the value of the machine-produced commodity regulates the social value of all commodities of the same kind, and it is this contradiction which in turn drives the capitalist without his being aware of the fact to the most ruthless and excessive prolongation of the working day. Now what's going on here is this. You're taking the labourers out of production, and as you remember, the capitalist is interested in the mass of surplus value, which is the rate of surplus value times the number of labourers employed. Reduce the number of labourers employed, you've got to have a huge increase in the rate of surplus value to maintain your surplus value. Does the machine give that to you? And if it doesn't, aren't you walking straight into a serious contradiction? In fact, one of Marx's great theses, which he's going to explore in Volume 3 of Capital, is that technology has a destabilizing effect upon, the st upon a capitalist system. In fact, it undermines the production of surplus value. But capitalists can't stop their search for new machines, because remember, what they're looking for is that ephemeral form of surplus value that comes from that brief mo time when they have a technological advantage over everybody else. Then they get relative surplus value. But when you aggregate this up and look at the dynamic of the whole system, you kind of say individual capitalists behaving in their own self-interest, i.e. searching for that marginal bit of ephemeral relative surplus value, 
create a disequilibrium in the whole system, which can cre create a crisis in the whole capitalist mode of production. And this occurs without capitalists being aware of the fact. Which leads him on 532 to spell this out in a different kind of way. Well, bottom of 531. Machinery produces a surplus working population. This is something that's going to come back again and again and again. The role of a surplus working population. It says, which is compelled to submit to the dictates of capital. You throw people out of work by technological innovation, they're sitting out there unemployed, they're extremely vulnerable to being re-employed at a much lower wage rate. So this is advantageous. Hence, says Marx, the economic paradox that the most powerful instrument for reducing labour time suffers a dialectical inversion, and becomes the most unfailing means for turning the whole lifetime of the worker and his family into labour time at capital's disposal for its own valorization. What he started out with John Stuart Mill's argument is there explained. The question of intensification. You remember the definition of a value, which is socially necessary labour time, which is uh, at a given intensity and productivity. So he's already introduced the idea of intensity, but he hasn't worked with it very much right now. But what he's pointing out here is that machinery allows you to regulate intensity, because it is the speed of the machine which sets the pace and defines the intensity. You can start to speed up the machine. Uh, and he points out on 536 that there is something what you call the porosity of the working day, you can reduce the porosity of the working day. You know, when you're dealing with manufacturing, you know, people put down their tools and have a chat. Well, you can't do that on the assembly line. The assembly line's coming through and you're stuck, to, you've got to do it. And then you can speed it up, you know, the Charlie Chaplin, modern times kind of phenomena. So what, what, we've, what we're dealing with here is the possibility of intensification. But what capitalists also found, this is something else that comes up here, is a tension with the preceding section, what capitalists also <coughs> found was that a reduced length of the working day allowed them to increase intensity considerably. That if people were working for twelve hours, they couldn't concentrate for twelve hours. Whereas if you reduced it to eight hours, then people you could you could really keep people at it solidly for eight hours. So the whole idea of intensity becomes crucial in how the capitalists are managing the workforce, but also speed up becomes entirely possible. So this uh, becomes a thesis that he puts together uh, as uh, a general argument uh, for looking at the impact on what is going on inside the labour process. In other words, the technology and the labour process are linked together in such a way as to increase intensity and, and also to change the nature of social relations. So one of the things you have to do is to recognize that this chapter on machinery is written in that context. And what Marx does is to universalize what is going on in Manchester at that particular period into a general theory about what machinery and large-scale industry are about. Now there's a very serious argument to be made that if Engels had been located in Birmingham, the whole structure of industry in Birmingham was radically different. You didn't have large-scale factories, you'd had what we would call a agglomerated small workshops, producing guns and jewellery and and uh, the sort of gun and jewellery quarter of Birmingham was a very famous production quarter, which is very analogous to 
some of the industrial structures which have arisen in Silicon Valley and all the rest of it since. In other words, it was a, it was a much more decentered kind of system, a lot more subcontracting, a lot more kind of integrated. It was a very, very dynamic industrial form, uh, which Marx seems to know very little about. So he doesn't actually use the Birmingham experience to talk about what industrialists do. So he tends to think that all industrialists will go the way of Manchester, when in fact a good segment of industry, even at that time, was going the way of Birmingham. And if you look analogously today, you would say, well, you know, if I went to South Korea, particularly four or five years ago, and I'd look at all the employment and the che bowls and all of those kinds of things, I would come up with a Manchester view of the world. If I went to Hong Kong and saw all of the kind of industrial organization, the sweatshops and all that kind of stuff in Hong Kong, I'd end up with a Birmingham view of the world. And actually the Manchester versus the Birmingham view of the world has been very important in understanding the dynamics of industry. There is, I think, a serious bias in this chapter towards the Manchester view of the world. And uh, I think we have to you know, I'll, I'll lay that out because that's one of the arguments I want to emphasize next week that we're, we're going to be talking about the Manchester system. And what Marx is doing from that is saying this is going to become universal. And to some degree it has become universal, because the Manchester system of the sort he's talking about is indeed the sort of system you would have found in Pittsburgh, it's the kind of system you'd find in Detroit, it's the kind of system you would find in South Korea, but it's not the kind of system you'd find in Bavaria or the, the, the Third Italy, or you'd find in, in uh, the, the, say, the sweatshop complexes of Los Angeles, uh, or in Hong Kong, where it's sort of small workshop organization. So we have to we have to figure that in here. So this is, if you like, very important to put down a historical marker and say, look, this is what Marx is working from. I think he did a very good job of working on it from that perspective, but it's not the only perspective there is. So we've got to bear that in mind in bearing, going through the rest of this chapter. So I want to go to the end of this chapter, but I also want next week to do the chapter on absolute and relative surplus value, which is a relative, chapter 16, which is relatively short. This chapter on machinery is, is a long chapter, and like I say, you have to go through it and say, okay, what's he dealing with? Okay, here's the revolution, here's, here's the transfer, here's the effect on workers, here's the factory system, here's what struggles are about, so on. So he goes through a whole set of ideas, and you'll see him moving around some of these elements as he, as he does so, but we'll get back to that question you raised next week. Okay?